So they say you're supposed to keep the best till last. Uh, I have no idea if that's going to be true or not. I will let you judge that. But I'm already, I cannot believe there's that many people in the audience. I thought you'd all be sleeping it off, uh, having done a lot of dad dancing like me last night. So uh, welcome to this last session. Um, I will make sure that we're all away by five to two for the last uh, remarks by Fred. Um, and uh, I want to start with a couple of statistics to get you in the mood for this thing uh, I'm calling customer experience. 62% um, of statistics are made up, uh, so go with me, uh, but I, I still think these are, these are valuable. They come from uh, a report, a research report by a guy called Shep Hyken, uh, who is a customer experience expert. Um, they produce this report every year, and um, uh, it's a couple of thousand, um, uh, mainly corporate uh, folks here in the States. Uh, but uh, it's kind of the inspiration for, for this session. Now, this first one is a bit of a shock and awe statistic, okay? Uh, I don't know if you can relate to that. I certainly can, uh, particularly if I have to call the likes of British Airways uh, back in the UK at home. I, I get this sort of sick feeling in my stomach uh, because I know I'm going to be on hold for an hour or so, uh, and I know that they aren't going to be able to resolve my problem when I call them. So I'm not suggesting for a second any of your customers feel like this. I'm sure they do not. However, those that have never called you before, it could be that they do uh, because they've never had an experience of dealing with you before. So uh, this session is going to be about getting into your customer's mindset as much as anything else. Here's the second statistic, um, and uh, this, this really is the inspiration for, for this session. And I think this is, this is great news. Uh, customer experience, such an important part of, of the sales equation. And the, the great thing is, if you get it right, it actually costs nothing. It costs nothing to implement. Uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, during this session. We all know that if we sell on price, it, it can be a race to the bottom. And it's a good opportunity for me to bring up uh, a chapter. Um, I've dropped some stuff on the little flyers on the, the table there. But my second book, MSP Secrets Revealed, this, this uh, particular secret comes from a gentleman called Nigel Moore. Some of you will know from Tech Tribe. And I think this sort of sums up this, this area beautifully. Um, because coffee is a commodity. You can buy coffee for a dollar, or you can buy coffee for, well, a hundred dollars uh, if you do a bit of research on the internet. It's the same thing, but you can see the differential in price. The same with t-shirts, the same with flights. So all these things are commodities, but the price depends on the wrap that you put around it, uh, whether that's fear or comfort or, or customer experience. Um, and I think if you can get this formula right, it does enable you to charge more for your services. Because if so much of this stuff is the same to the next person, that you put the right wrap around it and you'd be amazed at what you can achieve. So, by the end of this session, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of tactics. In fact, more than six, I'm going to over-deliver uh, today. And um, what I want to explain to you is if you can get this right, customer experience will help you to win more business, and it will help you to retain more business as well. And if you remember nothing today, I want you to remember this, that customer experience is an ethos. It's about your whole business. It's not about a person. You don't have a customer experience person necessarily or a department if you were big enough. It's about an ethos which spreads uh, across the country. Uh, the, the country, the company, I beg your pardon. It was a very late night last night. <laughs> Like any good presentation, you have to have a bit of a framework. Um, and so what we're going to go through is six different areas. And I think sometimes people forget that customer experience starts with visitors to your website, okay, right the way through to those loyal customers. So prospects, customers, and I also want to focus uh, a little bit on your team as well and give you some, some tactics that I hope you can literally take and use when you go back to the office tomorrow. Very briefly, a little bit about me. Who is this English guy with red eyes standing up on this stage? Why is he qualified to talk about this stuff? Um, I've had a, a varied career. It started as a, uh, I built up and sold a couple of marketing agencies where I had to really understand how to service FTSE 100 customers, big corporate com uh, companies. Sometimes they say jump and you'd learn to jump. Sometimes you'd learn to push back. So I really started to understand how to deal with customers from a relatively early age. But in 2010, I think this is where I really earned my customer experience stripes, when I founded a business called Customer Thermometer. Some of you may have come across. Uh, it was the world's first one-click feedback tool. And uh, for the first um, two or three years of my time there, I was the help desk. And so I had to learn a huge amount very, very quickly about dealing with customers. 
But then after that, the second dog, five years after that, um, I spent most of my time working with people just like yourselves, coming to events just like this. We all know how that feels, particularly this afternoon. And uh, I, I very quickly started to understand the, the need for helping uh, companies just like yourselves develop teams and help them with their customer experience and their customer service. And that's why I put together this program, Help Desk Habits um, and the book. So that's my background. Um, I spent a lot of time talking and working with MSPs. And I'm going to bring out now a whole bunch of different things which I hope you can take and use tomorrow. So let's start with that. That framework, let's talk about visitors. Um, and about 18 months ago, um, I, uh, I started to be, I don't quite know why, but people started to ask me to review their websites. And I've subsequently uh, reviewed dozens and dozens of MSP websites over the last uh, 18 months or so. And I've learned a huge amount. And this is where customer experience starts. Um, it takes what, five seconds to make a good impression? Uh, that back button is literally only pixels away. Um, and the analogy I like to bring in, if you know, we've perhaps experienced it here during uh, the last two or three days, but if you're at a networking event and somebody walks up to you with a, with a limp handshake and uh, they start you know, talking about themselves and frankly being boring, what do you do? You make your excuses and you head off to the bathroom or the bar. It's exactly the same online, but it's more brutal. You don't know it's happening. And so it's so, so, so important to create that right impression, first of all. So here's three things for you to think about your website in terms of the experience that you give to your visitors. The first one is above the fold. And I'm going to show you a screenshot of my website. It's not perfect, but I'm going to pick out some things you need to be thinking about. Above the fold is the first part of the website that you see before you start scrolling. It comes from the newspaper days when the newspaper used to be folded over. This is the part where you need to spend the most time. You need to create that right impression or the back button is gonna be hit. So you need a statement, you need a, um, a, a heading where you can describe immediately what you do. And typically when it comes to uh, sites for MSPs, I would expect something around geographical area, IT support for New York City, something along those lines. It works from a search engine perspective as well. Can't go into that today but another time. A little bit of copy about who you are. Here's one of the most important things. Can you see the, four, uh, the five blue stars? A little quote. Immediately provide that experience to your customers, sorry, I beg your pardon, to your, to your visitors, uh, not just from you, but what your customers are saying. Social proof, so, so, so important, and we'll see more about that uh, a little bit later on. It needs to look good, it needs to be designed, and also, whilst this is quite abstract, this image, I would expect to immediately see an image of you, your team, your office. If you don't have such a thing, hey, your geographical area, you know, uh, uh, an image from your local city, town, that people can relate to. So immediately you're starting to reel people in. What I don't want to see from an aesthetic point of view is stuff like this. And I know this is not an MSP website, but believe me, I've seen sites which look quite similar to this. It needs to look good. You need to provide that right experience to people right off the bat as soon as they come and uh, visit your site. The other thing I'd also link to this particular image is that less is more. And maybe remember this little phrase that your site is there to do one thing and one thing only, and that's to start a conversation with a visitor. That's all it has to do. It doesn't have to give them everything. It has to give them enough. The third thing I want you to consider from an experience point of view for your visitors is I am on a crusade to banish the white tooth people, okay? Here they are, okay? They're all stacked up in the stock libraries and they need to be banished from your site forever. It is a terrible experience to give your visitors this type of image when they come and see who you are because these people aren't real. They're very beautiful, they're very handsome, but they're not real, they're not part of your business. The other thing I don't want to see is handshakes, because handshakes are terrible, terrible, terrible things to see on the website. So think about getting more creative with the images that you present to your visitors and give them the right experience, the right personality, who you are as a brand. As a slight aside, I've deliberately put this in a, uh, a screenshot um, from the, this particular library. Have a look at Envato Elements. Uh, it's a wonderful resource, uh, handshakes aside. Uh, there's all sorts of things in there, whether it be audio, whether it be uh, images, graphics, uh, web templates, and so on. It's super cheap, 
Uh, I've been using it for five years and it's completely brilliant. So there are some thoughts around the first thing that your visitor is going to see, the first experience of you as a business. Let's now take it on a step. Let's look at some of the things that you may already be doing, but hopefully there's some new things here uh, from your prospect's point of view. And the first thing for me, I'm just sticking with the website briefly, is to look at calls to action. What do your calls to action look like on your website? Are they clean and crisp like this? This is a, this is a real screenshot. It's Gary. There he is. Uh, you can see who he is. It's got, he's got a personality. It's warm. It's super, super clear how to get in touch with your business. Okay? Here's another example. This happens to be a company I work with uh, in the UK. It's similar. Dan's eyes look a little bit scary, if I'm honest with you, but um, uh, he, uh, he's a very nice guy, despite, uh, despite the image. But it's super, super clear. And I think this is another really important part of the experience that you give to, uh, to your visitors and to your prospects. Here's something else you might want to consider. And I've been doing this for the last uh, three years. Anybody who signs up to my Help Desk Habits program as a trialist, I send them a personalized video. Okay, it's a very, very simple one or two minute video. Um, I use well, there's services like Bonjuro, uh, Loom, others are available. Uh, and the reaction it gets, as I'm, I've done this, uh, I'm going to say hundreds of times now over the last three or four years, is extraordinary. And this is what you want when it comes to customer experience. And when you know, dealing with a prospect for the first time, if you could wow them, they go, wow, no one's ever done this before, then you're instantly memorable. Okay? It's not going to win you the deal, I know that, but it's about layering on a whole bunch of different elements to set yourself apart. And I think linked to this, this, I'm not saying you go back to everybody necessarily who comes through your website with a video. You might just want to pick up the phone, of course. But if somebody's perhaps uh, putting their email address for a, for a downloadable report, this would be a perfect thing to, to use to follow up. They wouldn't be expecting it. That's a great thing to add to the sales process. And I think that's another thing to mention from a process point of view, customers like to be guided. Okay? They like to be shown the way. They like to see that you've done this before for other people. So have that process in place. Figure out what works and continue to use it. The other, I've got made a little note here as well, and this may sound obvious, but I'm part of a number of different forums, and the number of MSPs I see who don't get face-to-face -face with a prospect as soon as possible is mind-blowing. And I think, for me, being at this event over the last three or four days, the people I've met, the conversations I've had, life is so different when you're face-to-face. -face. So I would definitely weave into your process, your, your, your uh, prospect process, getting face-to-face -face, uh, as soon as you can. We're going to continue with the, the prospects now, thinking about proposals. So I get to part of the work that I do reviewing websites. Quite often, proposals come into this. And I want to give you a, another little phrase to think about. I see terrible, terrible proposals, which are big, thick documents with massive watches of text. It's the same online as well. Use this one simple test. Ask yourself, so what, when it comes to every single paragraph uh, in that proposal? So what? Why am I writing this? Why am I asking a prospect to read this? Is it adding any value to what we do? If it's not, take it out. Okay? So don't put reams and reams of boilerplate in just because you feel that you should. Um, obviously, it needs to look good. I don't know if it's bound. Or, well, there's no right or wrong in terms of how proposals should work. There's plenty of automated systems out there, of course. Some people like to use PowerPoint, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because it keeps it super simple and maybe follow up with, um, uh, with a Word document in terms of uh, the, the actual uh, detail. Here's something else that um, I've certainly done in the past and I found this to, to really work and make a, an acknowledgement, part of that proposal process, that customer satisfaction is part of what you do on an ongoing basis. And the reason I say this is because it's, it's making an acknowledgement that actually things won't be perfect, perhaps for the life of a three-year contract. Things do go wrong. Stuff happens. And to provide upfront a mechanism that you are going to uh, uh, help them through the feedback process, and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail in a moment, is a really, really good thing. Uh, I, in agency days, I remember it being commented on by clients that we actually thought that customer feedback is an important part of the equation um, early on. One of the other things I would also absolutely recommend to give the right experience to your prospects is testimonials. This is the most, most important marketing asset you'll ever hold. It's the perfect opportunity to wheel out video testimonials. 
uh, or just you know get simple case studies, it doesn't matter. Having other people saying great things about you is such a great sales tool. Uh, and I really hope that uh, that's something you have in your armory. If it's not, go create, because it makes a big, big difference. So, what about the experience that you provide to brand new customers? And this is, of course, mainly about onboarding. Everybody in the room will have an onboarding process of some kind, I'm sure. Um, what I've seen, certainly working with different MSPs in the UK, um, not everybody gets the whole customer involved. Quite often there's an onboarding process with the main, uh, uh, the main buyer, the main or the, the, you know, principal within that particular uh, company. Top tip is to have uh, an email sequence written that you could use all the time. Get the email addresses of everybody that you're going to be talking to within that organization. Chances are you may have taken over from somebody else. They may have been big fans of the other company. So your job is to win over everybody you're going to be supporting going forward. So think about a little email sequence to introduce yourself as a business, to explain how to get in touch, all those sorts of things. Go direct to the end users if that's possible. They may not allow it, but it's a great thing to, to try and achieve if you can. I've seen a lot of people sending welcome gifts on day one, whether it be pizzas or whatever, just to win over hearts and minds. I think that's a really nice touch. It's about over-delivering uh, on the promises that you've made. That was very dramatic, sir. Very dramatic. <laughs> Brilliant timing. So here's something else. I want to talk a bit about customer feedback now. And with new customers, nipping issues in the bud early is so, so, so important. It's the time where you're most likely to run up against issues. And providing a piece of a, a, a tool, this happens to be customer thermometer. I'm not affiliated with the business anymore. Many, many other tools are available. There's two things I'd like to recommend to you here to make sure you're getting that experience right and that feedback coming through. First one, I'm, I'm sure many of you are using feedback buttons on bottom of tickets. Um, uh, this is something I used to promote uh, you know, 10 years ago, and uh, I think we have to be careful about this now because the reason we created the one-click buttons originally was because of survey fatigue. 20 question surveys, people sick of them. If we're not careful, this will happen with simple, simple feedback. So a couple of thoughts for you. There's always an opportunity to add feedback buttons at the bottom of every ticket, but also on ticket closure. And I think every, every customer is different. If you send too many of these types of requests for feedback, then sometimes people would come blind to them. Another option for you, again, this happens to be a customer throwing to thing, but you could use any tool, is a monthly poll. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean by this. So rather than having feedback buttons in every ticket, to actually say once a month, uh, once a quarter, whatever's appropriate, uh, an email out to everybody in that organization. How are we doing for you at the moment? Just a simple, open question. And the thing about this, and the reason we, we happen to design it like this, the top two, typically gold and green, means you're happy, of course, to a lesser or greater extent. The bottom two means you're a bit fed up, something isn't right. Okay, to a lesser or greater extent. And we actually had this system in place, one of the marketing agencies I was part of, and I was on the receiving end of it as an account director for Fujitsu. We used to send this out all the time, and it worked to treat, because one day I got a, an amber light through, and we had a very simple service level agreement, and this is what I'd recommend to you. If you're going to implement feedback, you have to act on it, or it's pointless. If an amber light comes in, so the third one down, the account director gets on the phone to that customer within an hour. If a red light comes in, more serious, then the managing director got back to the customer within an hour. So I did this on this particular day. I picked up the phone and called this person up and said, look, what's the problem? I was with you yesterday, you were fine. He said, oh, I didn't get an invite to this particular event and I'm fed up. I said, oh, don't worry, we can sort that out. Now, if we hadn't had this sort of feedback system in place, we would never have known that. This would have festered, this would have gone on, and this particular gentleman would have got fed up with this. So, silent customers are the worst. If a silent customer, you don't know what they're thinking. And when it comes to contract renewals, then uh, guess what? It's always going to be a big surprise. So track how your customers are thinking. Use the most appropriate tool. Use the most appropriate mechanism as well in terms of how you get your feedback. Um, again, there's a whole ton of stuff, customerthermometer.com, the blog stuff is, is huge uh, when it comes to, to customer feedback. So if you're interested in more stuff, uh, please, please go and take a look at what they're all about. 
Okay, so we've onboarded a customer, we've given them the great experience, we've figured out how we're gonna get feedback from them, that's fantastic. What about now, business as usual? Two or three months in, um, uh, we've got you know, day-to-day support going on. Um, and for me, this is where you need to establish the wow factor very, very early on. Um, and I guess, kind of fill the emotional bank account, because quite often, you know, things might go wrong into the future. So if you can set people up early on and, it, and, and show how good you are as a provider, that's got to work. You've got to communicate. Uh, you, you, if people are chasing you on, on ticket responses, then you're getting it wrong. There's nothing finer for me as a, as a consumer. You don't mind waiting. And if somebody gets back to you and says, look, we haven't quite found the answer yet, but we'll be back to you tomorrow. It's an amazing thing. It never happens. So to receive those sorts of updates is fine. Most people will wait. So if you don't already have that built into your PSA, make sure you're keeping people up to date with what's going on. This is the other thing I, I, I want to talk about. Um, um, this happens to be a, a desktop wallpaper, okay? It's happened from the Help Desk Habits program. Create your own. Desktop wallpapers are a brilliant way of reminding people what you want them to be reminded of. So this particular one, I, I want to talk about an experience that, that we provided uh, when I was on the Help Desk at Customer Thermometer. It's the bottom word, uh, well, attached to getting personal. But it's remember. And I'm, first of all, I'm not saying you should do this all the time. It's not appropriate. Automation um, and uh, self-service, of course, super, super important. But for me, people still want to deal with people. I think even post-pandemic, uh, I certainly see that need to, to bond with people, to get on with people. So what we used to do, um, and as I say, needs to be appropriate, um, we, you'd end up having conversations with customers on the phone or via, or via tickets, and you know, you'd find out that little Johnny was off to university next month, or that you know, somebody's wife had just gone into hospital or something. And we'd remember this stuff. And in you know, two weeks' time, a month's time, we'd put a little internal note in to say, hey, let's just ask the question, how are things going? People can believe it. Again, I'm not saying you should do that all the time, the fascinating thing for me, I went over to um, uh, Southern Ireland about a month ago and filmed a whole bunch of testimonials for a client. And one of them came back when we were doing this interview and they actually named a couple of technicians and talked about how brilliant they were. They'd been clients for 10 years, okay, um, because of the relationships that they formed. So I think it's really important to remember the importance of the folks on that front line and the, the, the amazing job they can do if they're encouraged to get personal with customers uh, and do this, some of that remembering stuff. Here's something else very, very, no, I'm not gonna reveal it, I'm, uh, I wanna set this one up. Uh, another example of what you can do for, well, not just new customers, but for any customers, when someone submits a ticket, typically they're pretty fed up, they're cross, they can't get on with their day, something isn't working properly. And when they do, 99 times out of 100, they will receive an email a bit like this, the autoresponder. And I want to ask a question to you all that I ask in every session I give on this subject. How many people have changed their default autoresponder from their ticketing system, their help desk system? That's more than I normally see. So congratulations to you all. Those of you who haven't, when you get back to the office, think about how it feels, what's the experience like for an unhappy uh, customer who needs to get themselves, uh, or needs, needs to find some support to receive something like this. It's horrible. Change it. Make it warm, make it personal, use a first name tag, um, get some, some personality in there, and sign it off with a real person, a real person, okay? Not just the support team, support company, or nothing. Make it real, put some personality in it. And when people receive this type of message, they think, oh, hang on a second, maybe this is gonna, this is gonna work. They, you immediately feel better, as opposed to having that robotic, automated email sent to you. So, it's a tiny thing, but everything helps, as I say, if you layer it on uh, to get that, uh, get that experience right. <laughs> Number five, uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, loyal customers now, people who have been with you for, for a very long time. Um, and for me, they're one of your biggest marketing assets. And so, you know, what's that got to do with customer experience? And for me, if you can drive everything you do with customers through their journey with you, with a goal of achieving a review from them or a recommendation, it drives the right behavior. Because reviews and recommendations are everything. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier on. And for me, these loyal customers, of course, are your biggest source of reviews. 
And I want to give you a couple of techniques uh, because people say, oh, Mark, how do we get reviews? You know, I've, I've tried doing the Amazon gift cards, it never works. I want to give you a couple of techniques um, that you might use um, and as a result of the experience that you've given to people. Here's the first one. Um, and again, guess what? It's a desktop wallpaper because it works to prompt the technician. Um, they've had a conversation with a customer, whether it's, uh, well, I guess in this case, it's on the phone. The customer's gone away really, really happy. And before they put the phone down, uh, we went, this is a company I work with in the UK, and we went on a bit of a drive. There were kind of like no Google reviews. And uh, we went on a drive, so we need to get this stuff working. So we simply asked the engineers, ask them for a Google review. Okay? Just ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. My dad always taught me that, and it's very, very true. Um, I'm going to ask to use the swimming pool later on after I've checked out. I bet they say no, but if you don't ask, you don't get. If anyone's got any inside information on that, please let me know. Um, so uh, we did that, and it's, it's initially uncomfortable for an engineer to do that, uh, but uh, it worked. And within about six months, uh, uh, the, the Google reviews went up to about 18 uh, or thereabouts, and that, that will continue. But here's, a, here's another technique for you about getting reviews. Um, and there's, there's a full SOP on the website here, which I, which I put together. This happens a lot. The ticket bounces backwards and forwards. The engineer... Um, uh, solves the problem, the customer writes back and goes, you guys are brilliant, thank you so much. The engineer looks at that and goes, ah, oh, cool, feeling good, and then hits close ticket. That piece of marketing gold is lost forever, and it's a crying shame. So, put a little process in place. Tomorrow, when you get back, educate your teams, and when they see... Uh, a, a, a great comment coming through, so have, have that process in place behind the scenes. Snip it out. Uh, get someone inside to, to ask the customer if you could use it uh, online. But more importantly than that, get them to leave it as a Google review, first of all. And then, of course, you can use it on your own site, too. Now, I didn't know these guys were going to be in the audience today, um, but uh, I'm going to big them up slightly because my Australian friends, my new Australian friends, um, have got this absolutely right on their website. And I have to say, most managed service providers haven't. And, and I work with them to get it right. Here is other people saying how brilliant they are. Okay? And I love the headline. It's not what we think, it's what others say. It's so true. Okay? Here's another example uh, from a company in London. Um, and uh, it, what's happened on that left-hand side, there's a little button, you see this occasionally, um, which says, you know, Google reviews, you click that button and up pops uh, all the latest and greatest Google reviews. Um, there is a, a service you can use that as a simple WordPress plugin called trustindex.io. Do not go to .com. Uh, I'm warning you now. It's, I, don't know, I don't know why, but just don't go there. Trustindex.io. Um, but this is another brilliant site, iceconnect.com, if you want to check these guys out. Um, they, they show their reviews and their wall of love, uh, if you like, very, very well. So that's something I would recommend you do with, with your loyal customers um, and really focus on that customer experience once again. I'm going to move to the middle of that circle of that, the, the, the framework now, and I just want to talk now a bit about your team. And I've deliberately chosen this photo for a reason. I want you to, to go away and, and, and just think for a moment. Um, most, many of us would have flown here today. Um, I'm being, I'll be flying back uh, tonight back to the UK. And long haul, typically, someone will pick you up or they'll ask you, how was your flight? It's quite a polarizing question. And you will typically say, oh, it was great. You know, I, I love British Airways. Or, oh, geez, it was terrible. I'm never going to fly British Airways again. And why do you say one of those two answers? And for me, typically, it's because of the handful of interactions you had with the cabin crew. Okay? If they're happy, if they're smiling, uh, if they bring you that extra gin and tonic, um, if they get you that glass of water when you ask for it, great. If they grunt at you, if they throw you a packet of pretzels, uh, you, know, you know the people I'm talking about. You get off that plane and you feel pretty great. It's the same for your help desk team. Okay? And I spend quite a lot of time uh, helping people to realize that those folks are the face of your brand, okay? the face of your company. Every time they interact with a customer, they have that responsibility on their shoulders, and the customer experience is everything. Okay? So if, if, they, if they react badly, if they deal with the customer badly, of course it will reflect on the whole company. So have a think about some of the things that you can do to uh, help your team understand that, particularly the younger folks coming through. Uh, 
typically lacking confidence. That's what I see uh, in the industry. Help them to gain that confidence. There's a couple of things that you can do, uh, and there's a, there's a whole talk around this, of course, but one of, the, one of them is empowerment. And, you know, as business owners sat in the room or help desk managers, allow your teams to help customers and deliver customer experience how they see fit. Don't constrain them so much that they can't do stuff. I'll give you one specific example of a, a vendor that's out there, I know for a fact, doesn't allow their uh, help desk team to use emoji. And I don't know why. It's a corporate policy. Um, and I just think that's just rubbish. You know, people react to, they, people want to use them, the younger folks want to use them. Why would you do that? So empowerment. I sat on a panel in London um, about six weeks ago and I sat next to a very successful MSP owner. We were talking about empowerment and he, he just absolutely, one of the things they do, they allow a 100 pound, a dollar, doesn't matter, budget uh, for, or, or threshold for each of their team members. So if someone needs to spend 100 bucks to get something done, to put a, I don't know, a taxi, a, a printer in a taxi, they can just go and do it. They haven't got to go and ask the boss. So empower your teams. Allow them to serve customers as they see fit to do the right thing. And then the last thing I want to say on this, um, which I, it's not my phrase, it's a phrase of somebody I met uh, two, three years ago, a brilliant guy, uh, who said to me that customers shouldn't feel metrics. We are very heavily metric-driven, KPI-driven in this room, I know, quite rightly, but don't allow your customers to feel any pressure that's put upon your technicians to respond in certain amount or close tickets by a certain time. Allow them to, to be who they are uh, and make sure your customers are not feeling uh, those metrics. How can, you fit, how can you pulse that? By using some of the feedback techniques that I talked about earlier. So there's more than six, uh, I'd like to think. Uh, little thoughts, tactics uh, across the whole customer life cycle there. Just want to mention the, the, the Help Desk Habits program. It's right here. It's um, five hours worth of training. Me looking a little younger, less gray hair, uh, but um, uh, and it ends in a, a certification. Um, some of you know who Basil Forty is, I'm sure. Um, I, I kind of want to leave you with, with something here. This is not my quote, of course. Mayor Angelou, I'm sure many of you would have seen this before, uh, around people always forget what you did and what you said and so on. It's about how you make people feel. Here's a desktop wallpaper, okay? Um, if you, actually, if you sign up to have a Help Desk Habits trial, you'll get a bunch of these. Just, just, you just can just download them. Um, but I think that's such an important quote uh, in, in context of what we've just been talking about over the last 40 minutes or so. It's about how people feel. Um, so a, a, an offer for you, please, just get in touch with me. Let me know you've done something after this, okay? We're, we're all tired, we've all finished our conference now. It's so easy to go back to the office and think, oh, I've learned all this great stuff, and you know, two weeks later, it's all forgotten. So go and implement one thing that you've heard today that might hopefully make a bit of a difference to, to you and your team. Um, and uh, I'd love to know uh, how you get on. Um, this is me. Um, please connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. I, I love uh, I've got MSPs right around the world that, that I deal with. I've got to put the QR code up as well, so I'll leave you to, to scan that. Last thing I wanted to say to you, uh, on your desks, uh, there is a little postcard. If you're interested in contributing to um, this episode two of this book, um, it would be wonderful. This first, ep this first book had 101 secrets in from people just like yourselves. So you contribute one secret, and my promise to you is I will send you a copy of the new book when it's published in January. So hopefully that's a, that's a good deal. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I want to thank you for being here. I can't believe you were here. This is amazing. Uh, I'm sorry about my red eyes. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard today. And um, uh, safe travels home. All the best.